What is up, E7 fam? Pat here to talk about the newest ML5 star that was shown this morning, which is the lion, the antagonist for episode three. I'm going to give you my initial thoughts and impressions on the character. We're going to go over, obviously, her stat pool and her skills, some possible builds. Do I think she's worth pulling and things like that and so on and so forth. So if you're new here and you like this kind of content, please consider leaving me a like or subscribe. And obviously, as always, Leave me a comment down below if you disagree with anything I say in the video. So let us just jump into the analysis. So Belion is a light knight with the Ares Zodiac symbol, which is the same stat line as Lilius and Red Cecilia. And Red Cecilia is a character I feel like a lot of people will be comparing her to, not because, you know, or not, I should say, not just because she has the same exact stat line as Red Cecilia, but because they do do a number of similar things, specifically with the S3 and how the S1 sets up the S3. Or I should say, in the case of Red Cecilia, the S2. They have a skill that can set up the S3. And we'll talk more about that in the skill section. If you actually just want to know the particulars, 821 attack, this is whatever for a knight. They usually have health scaling to begin with. It doesn't really get much higher than this anyway on a knight, so don't worry about it. 6,751, not the highest for knights, but it is still a respectable HP total. 110 speed. The Ares Zodiac symbol has the second fastest speed amongst all knights. Falconer Clury is actually the fastest, and that is largely due to her rune tree. So Belion is tied for the second fastest knight in the game. So that is super, super awesome for her. 648 defense is respectable. Again, not the highest, but it is a very good number overall. Standard crit hit chance and crit hit damage. Uh, stats as well as dual attack chance and then she has 18 percent effectiveness which does let you get an edge on certain characters such as dps when it comes to potentially landing debuffs or strips or things like that overall this is probably my favorite stat line for a knight to have i have built multiple aries knights at this point on my account i really do like it because it does offer you the flexibility of having uh, a character that can be tanky as well as fast as well as have high effectiveness. you can get a very balanced stat line if you want with this but you can also really push it to the limit and get the knight to be incredibly fast. You can get the 250, 260 knight if you really want it. So it allows Blaine to be flexible in her builds. You can be very slow and bulky, very balanced, very high effectiveness character as well. Or you can be just a blazing fast character if you really want. So I like a stat line like this because it lets me play a range of options for the character. Uh, and they're not just tied down to one specific thing. So based on how you interpret the kit you have lots of options so that's really good so let's talk about the kit now in the order that it was shown the first thing is the s2 passive which is shackles of suppression it decreases the number of souls gained by the enemy by 100 percent as far as i am interpreting this that means that an artifact such as to hegel's ancient book which makes you acquire 20 souls at the start of the fight you cannot get those souls so already we're in a very good spot when Shackles of Suppression can counter the most played artifact in the game right up there with Arius. Like, Tehagels and Arius are basically like the two most used, most, most played artifacts. They are probably the two best artifacts also in Epic 7. So when you are already coming for one of the best artifacts in the game that enables things like specific team comps like Cleave and enables specific heroes like Basar and spectre tenebria to be as good as they are we're already off to a pretty strong start and as far as i am understanding your opponent just doesn't get souls as long as belion is on the board and if that's the case we have a knight which is the hardest class to get off the board it makes it so your opponent can't gain souls which are pivotal for a lot of things especially in the current meta game post angelica right now because of how good angel of light angelica is the way that you see people uh, try to combat it at higher levels in Champion, Emperor, Legend, things like that, is they play to Hegel's Ancient Book on a character like Politus, so that that way their maid Chloe can use uh, the Soul Burn to get an extra turn to get around and cleanse the Silence from Angelica, or you use the Soul Burn on Politus herself to kind of just go around the Silence and then you know hit them back with an s3 and blind them to kind of like free up the fact that since you're silenced you might as well take away their chance to hit so right now to hegel's is kind of like the meta and it is it revolves heavily around that book so belion shutting off the thing that is enabling or at least the meta is revolving around already makes the character in my eyes uh, a very 
strong contender for your Mystic Medals. Probably something you should be pulling just based off of the first half of Shackles of Suppression. So, again, good start for a unit. At the start of the turn, has a 70 to 100% chance to get a random buff for one turn based on Mulligores. The random buffs that you can get include increased effectiveness, increased crit hit chance, and continuous healing. Two of these, I think, are actually quite good. The other one, which is increased effectiveness, the first one, is not amazing. There could be something better in the slot, but it's not terrible. The character does need effectiveness for both the S1 and the S3, so getting some amount of free effectiveness for your move is not that bad in my opinion. I see people saying all of these buffs are completely worthless. I disagree with that, um, but they are not the best. Increased effectiveness in particular because it's only 30%. Um, 30% is not really gonna be helping you that much with hitting characters that you probably already couldn't have hit based on how you built the character. Um, the only time increased effectiveness probably is coming into play is like Frenzy 4, Frenzy 5 plus, and you proc it and maybe it helps you edge out against a specific soul waiver so not amazing but sure that's fine increased critical hit chance is a bit more interesting in my opinion most people the way they play fallen cecilia they get you know good speed good bulk good defense and health things like that and then they usually have a small amount of stats left over that they can do whatever they want with you can either go a little bit of effect resistance you can go more health and defense uh you can go uh, effectiveness, which is what I do. I go a little bit of effectiveness, so I have a chance to provoke blue crowls in the later frenzy stages, so that that way I don't get potentially horse and it can lock up a game for me. I consider that worth it. But the most popular one you see at high end is having Fallen Cecilia on critical hit chance as her like extra stat that they are dumping into her. And that is so that that way she will almost always crit, which means that her health scaling moves will actually have some oomph to them, especially the S3, because rather than only doing like maybe, you know, 2.5, 3K damage to everyone with the S3, you're going to end up doing something like 3.5K, maybe 4K to somebody uh, off of the S3. So that little bit of damage starts to add up over the course of the game and makes your Fallen Cecilia feel a little bit scarier than the standard tank that isn't really hitting for that much damage. So even though that Fallen Society doesn't have a lot of critical hit damage, the fact that they are always critting means that you are slowly whittling down the enemy team in bruiser and mid-range base matches. But against Cleave, it, they really feel it because they have no mitigation and their characters are made of paper. So like 4k damage to them is like half their life. And the fact that Belion has increased critical hit chance in the kit as a random chance means that sometimes against a, a, a team like Cleave, which Belion already is pretty good against because of the first half of this passive, she can do quite a bit of damage. Like, increased critical hit chance on Belion is better than her getting an attack buff in most scenarios because, spoiler alert, she has health scaling and not particularly great attack anyway. So I really like critical hit chance here. I think it is a bit underrated for the character. I think it will add more damage to the character than I think most people are giving it credit. Uh, I think a lot of players are going to look at that and go, why would I want this? This is a character that's not here for damage. Well, it's so that the damage you do do is at least somewhat more substantial. And then the last one is continuous healing, which again, there are better things to be getting, like maybe like a defense buff or things like that. But having a big bulky tank that makes it so my opponent can't get souls is a problem for them, which means they're going to try and get Belion off the board. And if she's has any way to kind of keep herself alive even longer that's a big problem for uh, them that's why like an artifact like holy sacrifice might end up being really good on her because not only does it give a whopping 988 health um it does you know give you that extra life which means that for teams that want to use souls that need souls they have to kill belion twice and like let's say you proc continuous healing uh, on the turn after you revive on holy sack with the barrier you can sustain yourself for uh, you know just a little bit longer, which could edge out some games. So overall, this passive alone, like by itself, everything that it contains, is enough for me to consider Belion worth your bookmarks. I know a lot of people are disappointed with the other areas of the kit. They might feel they're uninspired, not original, and we'll talk about those in, uh, going after this. But I think that. I'll say it right now. I think Belion is worth your bookmarks just because of Shackles of Suppression. She might not be played in every match, 
but this is the kind of passive that is devastating as a fifth pick option. It is akin to somebody like Blood Moon Haste where you kind of have to ban Belion based on your lineup. Like if you went Spectre first pick, Carrot third, fourth pick, and then somebody goes fifth pick Belion against you, your DPS lose a ton of value. And that's even in a non-cleave example. Your DPS lose so much value. And a lot of people are saying like, oh, but she's hard countered by Rem or hard, you know, you know, Last Rider Crow or all these things. Well, you know, maybe if there's a meta shift, LRK might come back, but those units have answers already. You're not going to pick Belion probably in every match, but, you know, for the most part, she seems pretty good as at least a fifth pick in high end just for this passive. That's enough talking about S2. Let's move on to S3, which is Apocalypse, which is a bit of a weird name to name this because uh, this move looks and sounds like it should do a ton of damage and we don't have the damage multipliers. Maybe it might have something absurd like 30%, 40% health scaling that would make it just a monstrously busted move that does a ton of damage. But this is on a knight that's probably not here to do a lot of damage. So this is a little bit of a, uh, uh, a misnomer, I, I, I guess you could say. So it is an AoE attack that decreases combat readiness by a random amount between 20 and 40% on the enemy team, as well as has a 100% chance to provoke everyone for one turn. It increases the defense of the caster for two turns, and the damage dealt is proportional to the caster's max health. Gives three souls on use, four to five turn cooldown, depending on Mulligoras. So remember when I said we're going to be comparing her to Red Cecilia? Well, Red Cecilia has a move that is an AoE provoke for one turn with health scaling damage that gives her some beneficial effect that allows her to tank all the provoked characters easier so apocalypse is very similar to red cecilia's s3 which i believe is uh ruinous retribution i think is the name which for some reason both of these have pretty cool names i guess for s3s that provoke uh it's hard to evaluate which one is better i think i would probably give it to fire cecilia because it's been buffed so many times at this point so Obviously, they both have 100% provoke, so they just cancel each other out. So you're you're basically weighing is two turn immunity for the whole team plus a small barrier better than a CR pushback, excuse me, and a defense buff for Belion for two turns. So in both cases, both mitigate the damage, right? Both of them are mitigating the damage that the provoke does. And which one is going to be better is going to depend on the situation. I think at full life, if my character is at full life, I would rather have the defense buff for two turns because any damage I take is going to be mitigated significantly more. But as my health total starts to decrease, say like I took a ton of damage off the rip from Arius, like say my Belion is wearing Arius, right? And I get hit by like uh, an Arbiter Villager S3 and I've already been chunked for like 40% of my life through the Arius splash damage and things like that. The barrier starts to sound a little bit better there, uh, especially as you go lower on health because like if you only have 5% health, the defense buff is probably not saving you, but a barrier might be able to save you. So it's kind of a push there, which one is better. They, for the most part, are, you know, equally good um one is slightly better in another situation versus another and i think where i think belion really uh loses out compared to red cecilia is i think i would rather have two turn immunity than a 20 percent where because we'll, we'll assume the lowest one because you can't guarantee you're always gonna get the 40 you're gonna get the high roll so let's assume the worst case scenario uh, 20% pushback on the enemy team. I think I would rather have two turn immunity than a 20% pushback, especially because Belion, depending on how you build her, is probably not super fast. So a pushback on a character that is not really going to go first might not be uh, super great in certain scenarios. It could be great in other ones. If she's going last, obviously, and everyone who had immunity went before her, then that's great because it allows her to kind of play catch up and allows the rest of your characters, if they didn't, uh, you know, go first to pull ahead for the most part. So I do think Apocalypse is a, is quite a good skill. It's just a bit awkward because the Red Cecilia has the same problem. It's not a traditional S3. What I mean by a traditional S3 is like most characters in this game, their first turn, they just S3. You just, you know, throw it out there. You just, if, if, it, if it's your turn, you just jam the S3. For most characters in this game, just jam it. Um, Belions has a little bit more nuance because most people have immunity and if they are slower than Belion, 
then you're not going to be able to apocalypse for good value at all like you you'll be basically doing it for just the damage and the increased defense you don't get any of the additional effects for it and that hurts cecilia has a similar problem both of them though do have this really nice thing where they can kind of set it up but we're, we're getting off the off topic for a second going back to like what i was saying about the traditional if you're not gonna be an s3 that is literally gonna fire right at the start of the match then that means you are in the same kind of category as a character like blue crow or like a dark corvus where it's a more nuanced move that requires specific timing uh to actually use effectively and those are generally not going to be the greatest S3s unless, you know, it's completely backbreaking. Um, luckily for us, with Provoke can be potentially backbreaking. It's just not going to be, it's not going to be Blue Crow, basically. So I do think that hurts her because Red Cecilia has some issues for the same reason. Uh, because it's not just going to be an ultimate, you're just going to jam turn one. But overall, though, I do think it is a good move. I need to see the health scaling to see if it's got like if it's got monstrous damage on this move, then you know it's it's worth it even if uh, your opponent has the immunity. But we'll wait and see when the data mines come out and things like that. But it's not a bad S three by any means. It is definitely a good S three. It's just uh, a little bit more difficult to use, especially. Because again, it's got this this defense, which it kind of makes you want to use it uh, like right up front. Um, if it was the other way around, like if this had the barrier, I think this would be slightly better. Uh, and if Red Sicily had the defense, same thing. Like I, I just, I, it's one of those things where turn one, I'd rather you know, if they don't they don't have the immunity, defense is great. Otherwise, I'd rather have the barrier. <laughs> so yeah, we're we're getting off topic here. Let's move on to Light of Destruction, which is again. The setup move, like how Red Cecilia has her S2, Light of Destruction is going to end up being the setup move for Belion. So, Light of Destruction is an AoE attack, so this character cannot single target attack. It's only AoE, which is a big problem for the character, or at least according to a couple of people. Uh, it has a 50 to 65% chance to dispel one buff from all enemies, which is quite nice. Having a two-thirds chance to strip is really, really good in my opinion. And when it's on the caster's turn, has a 35% chance to activate Incursion as an extra attack. The damage on both Incursion and Light of Destruction increases proportional to the max health. Incursion is yet another AoE attack that decreases speed of all enemies as well as blinds them for one turn. So there's a lot to break down here. So, first off, it is an AoE only attack. That means that most people as you guys have probably already surmised at this point are like oh she's terrible because i can't pick her into green violet i can't pick her into um rem or any of these things well yeah you probably would want to ban those characters or potentially not play them into those characters but like being only aoe is not a death sentence a lot of times holiday euphine is being played a respectable amount especially if you watch a streamer like elf mage he is playing holiday euphine quite a bit at the high end and he is currently the ranked number one player on the ladder so that's you know a big boon for her um and then you see a character like red charlotte red charlotte is everywhere she's great right now and that so aoe i don't buy this aoe is a death sentence having the strip obviously is really nice especially when we get to this next part when used on the caster's turn so that implies that the first half of light of destruction can be used when it's not your turn now, history lesson. Since Dizzy came out in Epic 7, she was the first one with the AoE S1, and people surmise playing her on counter set means that the S1 has quite a lot of value, especially when you pair it with Yellow Violin for a strip. So a counter set Dizzy constantly is removing your debuffs and has this RNG element where you can just keep taking AoE damage. So that is already pretty good because that means Belion's Light of Destruction on a counter set functions pretty much the same way. You have another character that can AoE counter. They have not done this as far as I know since Dizzy because Holiday Euphine only works on her turn and a number of other characters I feel like only work on their turn. Uh, you have to correct me if I'm wrong. I do not own or play Solitary of the Snow so I am not really 100% sure if it's the case with her as well. But that is already pretty good, especially because unlike all of those other characters, Belion is a knight, which means she can play Elbrus Ritual Sword. So having a character who can hold Elbrus Ritual Sword and have a very high chance to just throw out random AoE attacks 
that Dispel boss is pretty good. So now if your opponent is playing a character like Ram against you, that as far as I know, that's not going to proc if you proc Elbrus Ritual Sword. Like, she's not going to counter your counter. Obviously, Mercedes will because Magic for Friends doesn't apply to that rule. But that in itself makes the, the move, I feel like, have a lot of inherent value, especially if you're not playing against some of these characters that people consider a death sentence. Violet's another one that people think is not particularly great. If you actually land the blind, though, from Incursion on Green Violet, that is pretty backbreaking for him if he's already blown his perception. He has to. Because Violet's counter damage when he's blinded is not it. It is just not enough. Um, this character obviously is going to probably be tanky enough to take quite a number of hits from Violet anyway. So, yes, there's counterplay to a character. And yes, those characters are played heavily. But I think it's ridiculous to completely dismiss a character because X, Y, and Z are in the meta when we already have proof to the contrary on characters like Charlotte that they can still succeed despite these other like really hard checks that exist. So I think that is uh, a major folly in logic, it just being like, all right, because this counter exists, it's unplayable. Every unit in the game has a counter for the most part, even Angelica at this point, Angel of Light, Angelica, people have surmised that having uh, Politus with a book is a pretty solid answer. Obviously, Belion now checks that, but there you go. People will find a way to make, uh, to get around things. People will find a way to naturally abuse things. So knee-jerk reactions to things don't, really help anyone is what i'm saying basically don't knock belion before you actually see what she can do don't immediately dismiss her a lot of people the previous banner myself included thought closer charles was very mediocre and not that good turns out charles is actually pretty damn good um as a character right now because of attack buff he has a really insane build path on lifesteal with shepherd of the hollow he does quite a, a lot of damage so that is a character that i feel like most people miss the boat on um, and you do see him and other characters like Red Mercedes seeing a lot of high-level play right now. Mercedes, again, was another one I feel like everybody dismissed because of bad stat pool. Didn't get a lot. Magic for Friends doesn't increase the thing. Yeah. We're getting off uh, you know, on a, uh, a, a tangent again. I'm sorry I keep doing that. But it is, uh, it, it's just things to point out to consider when you think about this hero. If, if, if everyone else is like us making these really bad assumptions that don't end up panning out as time goes on the same is probably true for this character as well so the other thing i want to talk about here is the soul burn which increases the effect chance of activating the incursion effect to 100 percent this is actually really devastating in my opinion i think this is a really good soul burn because a high effectiveness belion means that she's going to get not one but two aoe attacks when she soul burns She's going to potentially get the strip. So if your opponent has just immunity up and you soul burn light of destruction and strip all of the buffs because you have a greater than 50% chance on it, and then you hit them with a slow and a blind, that's really devastating because that means everyone else on your team is going to go ahead and then you can potentially do it again. So I think if you have blind and you have, say, book at the start and they have immunity, you can just kind of YOLO the light of destruction soul burn and strip all of their immunity away and potentially blind them all and reduce their speed, which is actually really debilitating. Like if you start the game with Belion and everyone on the team is slowed and blinded, that's really bad, especially for like something like a Counterlandy. If you go ahead of a Counterlandy, you strip uh, anything she might have on her, like say like an immunity and you knock her out of stealth because it's AOE, you slow her and blind her. That makes her S3, her first turn S3, like crazy. Like the, the, the impact that she loses is just a crazy amount in my opinion. So I, I really like this skill. Everyone's like hating on the fact that it's AOE, but like I think if you 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 know limit the amount of options that your opponent has, like the counters, like you don't let them have the rem, you don't let them have the last rider card. Like like let's say you third pick the rem and then you fifth pick the belion, you don't have to worry about that. And then you can really just start to see how debilitating a character can be when they don't have souls. We're just going to keep slowing and blinding you. We're going to push you back with Apocalypse. And then, oh, look, we have souls again. All right, cool. Now I'm going to reset the slow and the blind on you after you like just got out of it. That, to me, seems like a really good character, especially one that can hold a multitude of powerful artifacts, including Arius, which is, is still, in my opinion, the best artifact in the game. She checks the second best artifact in the game, and she has a number of crazy tricks we can do with things like Holy Sacrifice, Elbrus Ritual Sword. Character, to me, just feels like a definite pull. Like, everyone's saying 
Angelica changed the meta. Angelica is busted. I do not disagree with that. I do think Angel of Light Angelica is an absolutely snapped hero. And you must either ban the character or have a battle plan for the character because she is going to show up a lot. That said, I don't think Belion is as good as Angelica, but you will see Belion, mark my words. I do think that this is a character that will see a bit of play at high level RTA because she just hard checks a lot of things. And I think once people start to sit down and play with the character, they'll realize that there is quite a lot that the character can do. And some of the more questionable aspects of the kit, like the increased critical hit chance, will start to make sense and start to pay dividends on the character. So there you go. That's pretty much it in my long, rambly, almost half hour uh, talk about what I think about Belion. Do you guys agree with me, disagree with me? As always, let me do know down in the comments below. Let me know what you guys want to see next. Luna banner is coming back up. I promise you I will have a super awesome how to play Luna guide in the coming week or so. So if you want to see that, make sure you guys subscribe, hit the bell, all those things. And as always, enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the rest of your week. And have a good one. Later.